Hello everyone, my name is Pedro Oliveira, I'm a cardiologist with Virtual Veterinary Specialists and in this short webinar we will see what to do uh, when dealing with a, a dog with congestive heart failure. As you know, uh, any patient with congestive heart failure is a very fragile patient and we need to be very careful not to stress uh, more than we need to. Um, and it is challenging because often, especially if it's a, a dog that we've never seen before and we are not aware of uh, underlying diseases, whether there's heart problems or not, we just see a patient that is having trouble breathing and we don't know for sure what's wrong. Okay, uh, Analyzing the breathing pattern is useful and we have a more detailed webinar on this that I would encourage you to uh, uh, have a look at. Um, and uh, it's very important before you do anything else to reduce the levels of stress okay any patient that comes in with respiratory issues should be placed in a quiet area intensive care units kennel doesn't matter it needs to be quiet and be given some oxygen Okay, and that's the very first thing you do. We don't start doing tests, we don't start uh, uh, manipulating, listening to the chest if that's going to cause problems. And while the patient is in the cage uh, resting and um, you have a look at the breathing pattern and try to see if that's giving you any clue whether the problem is uh, inside the lungs, in the pleura, or uh, an airway obstruction problem. Okay, this is a dog with congestive heart failure with pulmonary edema, and this would be my typical plan. So oxygen and rest. You can use sedation. Um, a lot of people are worried about sedation that that will reduce cardiac function, make things worse, or even kill the patient. Actually, the stress of not being able to breathe is much worse than the sedation you can give. The important thing is to give the right sedation. And right sedation is very simple. Opioids are very safe. Butophenol, methadone, okay, butophenol 0.3 milligrams per kilogram is normally my uh, first choice. Intravenous would be ideal, but often they're so stressed you don't have, uh, uh, you know, you cannot have IV excess straight away because that stress might be enough to uh, make things a lot worse. So uh, subcutaneous injections, intramuscular injections, don't give oral medication because that's going to increase stress. Okay, but it's absolutely fine to use sedation. Um, opioid combined with or just by itself or combined with uh, midazolam, for example, alfaxalone. The problem with alfaxalone is it, it has a very short-acting um, effect, so it's not really going to um, allow the patient to be properly sedated and, and, and uh, not stressed for a long time. So it's the sort of drug that you use for a procedure, so it's fine to give a little bit of alfaxalone to then place an IV catheter. Uh, it's not going to have significant um, hemodynamic effect so it is safe to use in a patient with heart disease and heart failure but of course it's not going to be your choice for long uh, term sedation. Now furosemide uh, 2 to 4 milligrams per kilogram ideal IV but normally the first one goes IM. Subcut is less desirable because it takes longer to be uh, absorbed okay um, so IM is uh, preferred and then as soon as you can we'll try to get a catheter in uh, one of the veins so you can give IV injections. So I normally start with 2 to 4 milligrams per kilogram, normally 4 depending on how poorly they are and whether I'm giving it IV or IM. If I give it IV I would go for 2, if I give it IM I'd go for 4 for the first administration. And then as soon as possible <coughs> we need to get a catheter inside one of the veins and we need to take some blood um, and the minimum amount of information we want is PCV TP, so packed cell volume, hematocrit, total protein and urea creat creatinine and electrolyte. So we need to know uh, kidney function, potassium levels especially, 
and uh, we need to know whether we're dealing with a patient with anemia or dehydrated or uh, um, that anything that's going to influence our treatment and potential side effects. Of course, if you manage to get enough blood for a full hematology and biochemistry, perfect, even better. You can take blood from the IV catheter if possible. Uh, of course, sometimes in cats or very small dogs, that's not easy because it just clots and the sample is not good quality, but it is definitely less stressful. Remember, stress is a problem. We don't want to stress this patient, so even if we need blood but we cannot take it, we just don't take it. Pimobendan. Um, now, oral medication, I would not advise that if the patient is having trouble breathing. Uh, you have an IV alternative if if necessary, so 0 0.5, 0 0.15 milligrams per kilogram IV. Uh, if the patient is well enough to have oral medication, then I just use oral at the usual uh, dosage. And the brief heart scan. Now, we are assuming this patient has a heart problem from listening to his heart and seeing that there's a murmur, seeing that there is tachycardia, okay? Remember, if you have a patient with a normal heart rate or with a normal heart rate or low and sinus arrhythmia, that does not suggest heart failure. It suggests that the respiratory issues are due to other problems, primary lung disease, pleural disease, etc. Uh, so we need to take all of this information as soon as we can. We need to listen to the chest. We need to uh, listen to the heart, feel the pulse pressure uh, and, and see what that tells us. And as soon as we can, we need a brief heart scan because we want to know what we're dealing with, confirm that we are right and this is heart failure. Sometimes it happens that you give furosemide to a case and then realize well, actually this patient was not in heart failure. Is that a mistake? Well, not really, not necessarily. If you don't have an option because stressing that patient for a heart scan, even a standing one, is going to kill the patient, then furosemide. Uh, and then, uh, of course, as soon as you can, we need to know uh, that we're doing the right thing for that patient. If there is fluid in the chest or in the abdomen, which you would suspect from auscultation, from palpation, and ideally a brief uh, ultrasound scan, when you're scanning the heart, you check for fluid in the chest and fluid in the abdomen, we need to drain that fluid if it's too much. If it's not too much, then we don't need to worry. But if it's causing discomfort or preventing the lungs from expanding, then we do need to drain it. And often that's enough to make the patient much, much better. Now from the heart scan, we want ideally a diagnosis, know what we're dealing with, but not we're not going to perform a full scan. Just a very brief scan where we see left ventricle, left atrium, confirm whether the left atrium is enlarged or not because if it isn't then we're missing something and uh, often that gives you the diagnosis for example in this case mitral valve disease with thickened mitral valves uh, in this case also also thickened mitral valves and tricuspid valves the difference being that this muscle is contracting much better than this one so I need to be careful with this patient this patient has systolic dysfunction you will not be able to tolerate such high dosages of furosemide, for example, as these ones can without upsetting the kidneys, it will also may have trouble um, keeping blood pressure at appropriate levels. Okay, so that is important to know uh, uh, when you treat these patients. So, what should I monitor? I normally monitor respiratory rates every hour uh, to start with and then go to every two hours until I'm happy that the breathing rate is coming down. Now this is all done from outside of the cage without touching the patient, without stressing the patient. Okay. When I'm happy that the patient is stable enough that we can actually uh, manipulate him or her without causing uh, problems, then ideally heart rate should be checked. Um, I've placed here every two to four hours. I normally do it every four hours. But it really depends on the patient. If it's a patient with arrhythmias that we need to monitor the heart rate or we're using antiarrhythmic drugs, we may need to even use continuous ECG. Okay. Urine production is very important. 
it doesn't mean that you need to estimate the amount produced you just need to make sure that that patient is peeing and we would expect after giving a furosemide dosage IV we would expect urination in the next half an hour or so some patients don't because they're not, they, they're not used to peeing uh, inside the house or you know they need to go outside um, so they won't they will hold it but we need to make sure they are producing urine if they're not then we, we're in trouble with the kidneys Measure blood pressure also another ideal uh, thing to do that I would not do if that's going to cause stress but if I can do it without stressing the patient even if you'd need to put the cuff in the tail um, then I uh, every four hours would be my ideal choice I think every two hours unless there's hypotension and I'm trying to sort that then every four hours would be enough uh, going to twice a day when the patient is more stable and after 24 hours I would repeat the blood analysis to see if the effect of the furosemide or the diuretic that we chosen uh, on the kidneys if it's appropriate or not or if I need to worry about kidney function and electrolytes of course ongoing treatment well I told you the first one I'd go for 2 to 4 milligrams per kilogram and then I would use as soon as we have an IV catheter in I would use 2 milligrams per kilogram every hour or every 2 hours initially for the first 4 to 6 hours because most of the times within 4 to 6 hours or within the first 12 hours at least you would expect to see a lowering of the heart rate of the respiratory rate okay if you don't see a lowering of the respiratory rate, it doesn't mean that w uh, treatment is not working. It just means that patient needs longer or cases with systolic dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension, which are things we would check with a heart scan, um, they take longer and sometimes we need to use lower doses of furosemide. So we should not be giving up just because there's no response. But we would expect some response within that time frame. If necessary, and this is normally cases that are uh, more severe or not responding well to a uh, uh, furosemide then you could use a con continuous rate infusion between 0.66 to 1 milligram per kilogram per hour if necessary okay the disadvantage of this to me is that if I do boluses I, I, I know that every hour every two hours every so often someone will actually go there to administer it and will check the respiratory rate so if you're in a busy environment sometimes you 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 can uh, not be able to uh, to um, always check the patient when you should. So at least if you need to give the drug, I'm happier that someone will check that patient. Then once the heart the respiratory rate is uh, coming down, I would charge I would change to two milligrams per kilogram every four hours or every six hours until we reach two milligrams per kilogram every uh, eight hours so typically first injection and then every hour normally for uh, one to three boluses every hour and then I would go to every two or every four hours I tend to go to every four hours from then uh, for the next eight hours to twelve hours and then every eight hours for one or two days and then uh, twice daily okay and I would continue the Pimavan then and I would add the AC inhibitor and spironolactone once stable now I don't tend to use AC inhibitors or spironolactone during the emergency treatment uh, there is some evidence that AC inhibitors reduce the pressure in the left atrium so arguing that we perhaps should be using it but at the same time it will worsen the azotemia we're using a lot of furosemide so we may risk ending up with a dog that is azotemic, not eating and lethargic and then we have another problem also because of the changes in the renal perfusion that ACE inhibitors cause the furosemide will be a little bit less effective uh, than when used by itself okay so that's why I don't use some people use it it's not a mistake it's not wrong to use it but those are the arguments I use against it if it makes sense and remember that all always uh, water available okay they will be thirsty they need to drink drinking is not a problem we need to make sure that they are not too dehydrated because otherwise you will end up with an azotemic patient and also an uncomfortable patient because being thirsty is not a nice feeling okay 
So remember, watts are always available from the beginning. I hope you enjoyed. Please feel free to get in touch if you'd like help uh, managing your patients with heart failure. Um, we also have uh, a more detailed webinar on this subject that you uh, may want to consult. Thank you.